and do you get the feeling it's a bit of a Lee Mack and David Mitchell takeover tonight on BBC One? Guess who's in the hot seat now? Good evening. Welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm David Mitchell. In the news this week, at an England training camp, there's relief after one player makes a full recovery from his groin injury. <laughs> <laughs> there's evidence that the star of David Attenborough's latest TV series has been a bit greedy in post-show hospitality. And in Leeds, doctors unveil a new device to help people keep their drinking down to the recommended number of weekly units. <laughs> On Ian's team tonight is a comedian who says he hoped his live tour would cause arguments in the car on the way home. Presumably, as in, 30 quid for two tickets. <laughs> Whose bright idea was that? <laughs> Please welcome Andy Hamilton. And with Paul tonight is a writer, comedian and theatre lover who says she's seen Hamilton four times. Five now. <laughs> Please welcome Deborah Francis-White. <laughs> and we start with the bigger stories of the week. Ian and Andy, take a look at this. What will it be? <laughs> it's the former Prime Minister. She's resigned. <laughs> um, that's the new Prime Minister as of now. <laughs> oh, God, that's all of us. <laughs> We've got a deal. We've got a deal. And it's, it's extraordinary. No one likes it, mm. which is exactly right. It's fair, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Half the country don't like it for one reason, half the country don't like it for the other reason. So that's what you voted for, so there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs May probably does not have the numbers to get the draft agreement through Parliament. The Brexiteers probably don't have the numbers to, to topple Mrs May. Uh, the Labour don't have the numbers to force an election. Maybe they don't even have the numbers to get the deal through. Ask Diane through, Abbott, she's through, got the numbers. Through, 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 through. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're trapped. It's just going to go on like this. It'll only end when everyone involved dies. <laughs> Last week, particularly, was dominated by a very complex sequence of events at Westminster, which is probably best summed up by this BBC Sign Language interpreter. And you're in the chamber now from MPs <laughs> on all sides, in all parties, both pro and anti-Brexit, <laughs> over her agreement. It was, you know, more than an hour before... <laughs> <laughs> so how come Theresa May is still in office? There isn't anyone else. Yeah. And everyone's tired. <laughs> Theresa May is getting a lot of credit because she's not resigned. That is all she's done, yeah. is not done something, and everyone's gone, she's not done the thing that all the men are doing. <laughs> they cannot stop resigning. Yeah. And well, this... A few women, too. Esther McVeigh left. OK, all right, Esther McVeigh... I will give you Esther McVeigh, Ian, and that's it. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a bit of a shock on Christmas Day if you unwrap one of your presents. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to the stage now where, where I don't know who's in the Cabinet until they resign. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think they'll get all the Brexit secretaries back at the end, like the end of Strictly? And you'll go, oh, I've forgotten David Davis was in this series. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't all gloomy. I mean, there was the, the sight of Jacob Rees-Mogg leading a charge. Come on, chaps. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just me, then. Yes, what happened to those, those hundreds of uh, well, letters of no confidence I think that's that were going to happen? Sadly, I think that just shows how the art of letter-writing has been lost. <laughs> <laughs> Who tried to put the Frighteners on Theresa May in Downing Street this week? The Gang of Five. <laughs> um, the Pizza Plotters. 
the Sun has had a bit of fun oh, with the Pizza Club. Mm. And so, yes, they are Andrea Ledsom, who's known as Deep P Andrea. <laughs> uh, Liam <laughs> Fox, a.k.a. <laughs> I don't understand that. It would right. be easier if his surname was Pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> And Penny Mordant. Well, if that's the standard, Liam and Pineapple, Penny Mordant can be Penny Four Cheeses. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Penny uh, Peroni? No, Penny Pasta. Yes, you, no, you're right, it's Penny Roni. Penny yeah. Roni. Oh. I should be a terrible journalist. Chris. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Penny Roni. <laughs> Are these names they've given each other, or has this actually just only been given to this them is, by the paper? This, this so is... I would love it if they had given each other these yeah, names. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they sat around, and most of what they'd got done so far was giving each other pizza-based <laughs> fun names. I don't, think, I don't think the sun makes things up. <laughs> <laughs> um, who is really angry about the way the Brexit deal has, was negotiated? Oh, is this Gibraltar, France? No, this is... I'm thinking about Dominic Raab. Cos he was Brexit secretary for over five minutes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so he's got a wealth of experience to bring to whinging on telly. And now Dominic Raab is the bookies' front-running favourite to be the next PM. <gasps> so... Well, that's just ludicrous. He doesn't know that Dover and Calais are on different sides of the channel. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to be Prime Minister. Maybe well, I am. Well... The bookies say. Yeah. Oh, no! No! Landslide. So if Ian's going to be Prime Minister, can I be the man that shouts out to them as they walk along 10 Downing Street? <laughs> oh, do you stop the editing private eye, Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> Are those your own underpants, Prime Minister? <laughs> People say it's going to be Dominic Raab. And according to The Sun, he's a high-flying lawyer known as Big well, Brain. Why have we decided The Sun's the source of all wisdom? <laughs> Pizza name, just to be clear. Yeah. Dominic's Pizzas. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, you've grown at that one, be excited. <laughs> <laughs> he's a high flying lawyer known as Big Brains, and he's a black belt in karate. There's an alarming number of Tory MPs with an interest in martial arts. He's not the only one. Shall we lighten the mood by yeah, playing absolutely. a game of yeah. who's the most lethal? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, fingers on buzzers, everyone. Oh, yeah. OK. Shailish Vara. What's the question? What? <laughs> What's his martial arts skill? His martial arts yeah. is Taekwondo. It is. Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> he has a black belt in Taekwondo. I don't know if that beats karate or not, but I haven't Definitely. played martial art top trumps in years. Um, <laughs> uh, William Hague. <laughs> Judo. Yeah. Yes, judo. In 1999, he had a judo green belt. I don't know... <laughs> that was when the green belt was existing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's probably got a judo built-up area now. Uh, <laughs> uh, Steve Baker, the ERG man and hard Brexiteer. Yo, sushi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> origami. Yeah, origami. <laughs> He once had a fight with a cage fighter. We have a clip of this particular moment of martial artistry. <laughs> I saw this, I shouldn't have kept walking past, should I? <laughs> <laughs> there you are, look, you've just come round the corner. <laughs> so, he didn't really have a fight with him, did he? <laughs> well, he didn't win. We've also learnt this week that if there's a no-deal Brexit, we might have to start stockpiling what? Well, everything. Oh. Um, oh. Mars bars. OK. According to the mail, they could vanish within two weeks if we leave without a deal, <laughs> because key ingredients would go off within days if delayed at ports. I right. You wouldn't imagine there's anything in a Mars bar that would ever go off. <laughs> <laughs> and a disorderly exit from the EU will also mean price hikes for essential goods, as this man explained on Channel 4 News. I wanted to remain because my grenades here used to cost me a fiver. Right, now my grenades cost me a tenner. <laughs> and I've got to pass that price on to customer because they're from Holland. <laughs> can we... <laughs> can I make a personal plea to broadcasters? Brexit is obviously going to go on for another ten years. Can we stop the Vox Pops? If I see one more market stall holder who says, why don't they just get on with it? And uh, there was a guy the other night, all he said was, this is England, not France. He just kept repeating that. 
This is England, not one. That was his contribution. Yeah. To be fair, he's he was foreign secretary. <laughs> this is Brexit and the failed coup against Theresa May. A spokesman close to Michael Gove... Michael Gove? <laughs> ..told the Daily Telegraph he has decided to remain in government to see if he can influence things from the inside. Hmm. So, if you don't like an institution, it's best to remain in it and try to change it from within. <laughs> if only you'd thought of that earlier, Michael. <laughs> Paul and Deborah, take oh, a look yes. at this. On the air, OK, this is a man in Stevenage who is... That's him. He's been broadcasting from his garden shed uh, to his wife back in the house for 40 years. Every night he goes into the garden shed, he plays a rep for his wife. He's now been offered a job on Stevenage Radio because they deserved it after 40 years of, of playing rep for his wife. That is hugely correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, this is a man who's been broadcasting his own radio show from his shed for the last 40 years. I just told you that. And, yes. <laughs> and how many... Uh, how many his name's Deke Duncan. Deke Duncan, yeah. Uh, how many listeners would he usually get? Just his, his wife. One. Just his wife. One. Just his wife. I, yes. As mentioned in my answer. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> yes, according to The Times, yeah. Mr Duncan's first wife, yeah. Teresa, was his only regular listener. Oh. And uh, how did the local radio station who've offered him his own slot hear of his story? They went viral. <laughs> they did a little uh, piece on him, like a sort of human interest story, years ago in the 70s. Yeah, well, it's, was it nationwide? It was nationwide. Frank Boff. Um, well, there's no sign of Frank Boff in okay. the clip. Um, oh, it's a shame. <laughs> probably for the best. <laughs> um, we have the clip here. Mm. Here to try and put a grin around your chin, a special hello, how are you, going out right now to Mrs Theresa Duncan. I'm going to the shops, right, Deke? Radio 77's ratings could be in for a bad morning now that the station's entire audience has decided to go down the shops. <laughs> it's not really broadcasting, is it? <laughs> I think he's the godfather of podcasting. <laughs> I mean, this is... To be honest with you, my whole career is podcasting and I feel very much akin to this man. He has 40 years' experience and Stevenage Radio have offered him a trial hour and that's very much like being a woman on a panel show. <laughs> you do 400 hours of podcasting and then they say you can have one hour. This is my Stevenage. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm delighted. <laughs> But is Deke Duncan excited about realising his dream? Must be, yeah, absolutely. He admitted he was slightly apprehensive about his one-hour radio slot, saying, I don't know how I'm going to fill it. <laughs> <laughs> and who's been causing some controversy on the airways in Australia this week? Hmm. This is the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who's got into trouble over lewd comments he made about Pamela Anderson on the radio. He said something like, ''Ooh, I'd deliver her a message.'' <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean. I'd go nudge. in the shed for 40 years and talk exclusively <laughs> to her. It yeah. was some kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, wasn't it? It was. Pamela Anderson wanted the Aussie Prime Minister help to help WikiLeaks weirdo Julian Assange to come back to Australia and get a hero's welcome. When asked for his reaction, he had this to say. <laughs> I've had plenty of mates who've asked me if they can be my special envoy to sort the issue out with Pamela Anderson. Seems in like a sort the... of jokey way. He said that. Seems like the Me Too movement has passed Australia by then. Yeah. <laughs> In other Antipodean news, <laughs> who won Australia's Next Big Thing competition? Is this something to do with... Cos I was raised in Australia, mm -hmm. and when you would drive a long distance, it, from miles away, it would start saying, the big pineapple is coming. And when you got to the big pineapple, it was literally just a big pineapple that was as tall as, like, two skyscrapers. There's also a big banana, there's a big peach, there's a big... All of the big things you can think of, a big kiwi fruit. One of them got stolen, I think it was the big apricot. <laughs> and I remember it, the, 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 um, the press coming along and saying, ''Oh, what are you going to do?'' And he said, ''Oh, I wouldn't worry, mate, it's a 60-foot apricot, it'll turn up.'' <laughs> Is it that? Yes. <laughs> Yes, Australia's big things are oversized renderings of objects and they're a staple of regional tourism. And this year, four towns vied to win a competition to build a new big thing. Reporting on the result, The Guardian said, a campaign to build a big peanut in Queensland has humbly accepted its loss to a big melon. <laughs> 
Kirsty Board from the group representing the Big Peanut told The Guardian, we were disappointed to lose, but we were glad the Big Melon won. <laughs> this is the DJ who spent the past 40 years broadcasting from his garden shed and has finally been given his own show on Three Counties Radio. Deke Duncan presented his own radio show from the shed at the bottom of the garden, though he did keep a laptop to hand, so if anyone walked in on him, he could just pretend he was looking at porn. <laughs> And so to round two, the picture spin quiz. Fingers on buzzers, teams. There was a dance match recently where two men were playing against each other and each one accused the other one of uh, farting to put the other one off. <laughs> during the important part of actually concentrating on throwing the dart. And the, the farting got out of control so much that it turned into a farting contest. And then accuse each other of putting each other off by throwing darts. <laughs> <laughs> Have you made this up? Does it sound like I've made it up? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How did the accusations of gamesmanship start? Hey, did you fart? They put me off throwing me down. <laughs> yeah, what well, if I did, pal? <laughs> I, um, you, you... <laughs> what are you gonna do? Open a window? I'll open your window, pal. <laughs> Double top, take that. <laughs> you, you've brought that to life. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, it was well, one of the players who was a Dutchman. Oh, right, um, yeah. Wesley Harms. Yes. Uh, claimed that his opponent, the Scottish two time world champion Gary Anderson, had been farting on stage to put him off his game. He told Dutch TV, It'll take me two nights to lose this smell from my nose. <laughs> and how did Gary respond? I read this story and I was so disheartened by it. I'm quite phobic when it comes to this kind of thing. I think it's horrible and I think men everywhere should take a good hard look at themselves. <laughs> men have been in charge of everything for as long as we can remember and when are they going to have a crisis of confidence? They've been in charge of politics, the <laughs> environment and darts and it's yeah. all awful. Well, I don't think... <laughs> I think of those three, darts is going all right. <laughs> yeah. well, David, have you not heard this story? Yeah, they I... almost came to blows and it was really... Well, they did, but clearly, they're just putting <laughs> them off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how did Gary respond to the accusation, do we know? Yeah, if you're not tough enough to eat, I shouldn't have done it in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, he, did he drop his trousers to prove that he had not farted? No, no, well, not quite. But not he had... quite? No. <laughs> he dropped, he dropped his underpants. Yeah, he, he admitted there had been a bad smell, but pinned the blame on Wesley himself, saying, every time I walked past, there was a waft of rotten eggs, so that's why I was thinking it was him. He added, if the boy thinks I farted, he's a thousand and ten percent wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you mean to be good at maths when you're playing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how did he offer to prove his innocence? By dropping his trousers and... No, no. No? <laughs> he told the reporter, you can put your finger up my ass, there'll be no smell. It's <laughs> a hell of a catchphrase, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Fingers on buzzers, teams. I think this is a story about M&S in Nottingham putting up one window that said must have suits for men for Christmas and right next to it uh, another window of uh, lingerie saying must have fancy little knickers for women. That's and absolutely right. Yeah, Marks and Spencer it was accused of sexism over the way it's advertising underwear in its Nottingham store. A window display had this advert for men which says must have outfits to impress. Next to this outfit for women, must have fancy little knickers. <laughs> Why might M&S feel aggrieved about this attack? Well, they said that there was some ladies' dresses around the corner uh, <laughs> that were also must-haves. Um, yes. And there, but there was not a display of Y fronts. I don't want to see a naked man really. I find the, the display that they've got equally sexy. My idea of desirable is I'd like to see a man in jeans and a T-shirt just slip it off to reveal a three-piece suit. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if men looked like they were wearing a suit when naked, that would be a higher form of evolution, if we could yes. evolve to have well, natural... Uh, for me, suits. yes. I don't speak for all women. What, yeah. what if a man got naked but then painted a suit? <laughs> would that be arousing? I've told you, Andy, before, in the dressing room. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well... It's worth asking. <laughs> um, and how has the BBC upset people this week by censoring something? 
There was a documentary that uh, I'm not quite sure about the details. A documentary that was being shown in Africa, and there was a bit of pixelating going on. Yes, producers of a BBC Africa documentary decided to blur out the cleavage of a female interviewee. Let's have a look at, at what we can. <laughs> yeah. But is that um, because the cleavage was involved in a court case? <laughs> <laughs> BBC bosses said they felt the need to cover up because they were worried it would offend audiences in some conservative African countries. According to an internal BBC email, the decision to deal with Pam's cleavage was made at senior editorial level. <laughs> and that would be the head of cleavage. Yeah. Oh, H <laughs> HOC, as it's known. <laughs> Can I just say, the other lady's cleavage is quite low. I don't understand quite what the parameters were there. Are you pitching to be HOC? <laughs> <laughs> in yeah. that opening sequence where Michael Gove was running, mm. you could quite clearly see his man boobs, <laughs> and I think they should have been pixelated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Time now for the odd one out round. It's just one between you this week. Damien Hurst, Icelandic President Gudni Johansson, CNN's Jim Acosta and referee David McNamara. Well, Jim Acosta lost his hard pass to the White House for asking a question. Mm. Damien Hurst made a large statue of ovaries. Did Damien Hurst get into trouble for this statue of ovaries? Yes, they weren't pleased about it. Mm. I don't know if it's been thrown out. Uh, refs throw people off, so maybe it's the ref who sent somebody off and everybody else has been sent off. No. <laughs> it is to do with banning. Who is um, the man in the top right? As he and the ref and Jim Acosta all been banned, but Damien Hurst did something offensive but wasn't banned. No. Uh. So the Icelandic Prime Minister must be the odd one out. He is the odd one That's out. That's right. Yes, well done. The what do you mean, left? well done? Well, <laughs> just trying to... Word of encouragement. <laughs> just a one in four random guess. <laughs> the answer is they've all been given a ban, except for the Icelandic president, Gudni mm. Johansson, who said he won't ban pineapple on pizza. <laughs> Have we got some deal with a pizza? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, for a minute I thought he was the prime minister of a country. He actually works for Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> He's a buyer. <laughs> I didn't realise. I got confused. No, I'm awfully confused. No, he is. Uh, yes, he's the head of state of Iceland. Iceland. He's got oh. the rich history of Iceland. You know, yeah. 500 years ago, it was called Bee Jam. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, now this week, Icelandic President Gudni Johansson has yeah. been defending people's right to put pineapple on pizza. But who proposed the ban in the first place? The opposition leader. No, he did. <laughs> He proposed the ban on pineapple on pizza last year. He caused uproar in Iceland, as well he might. Yeah. Uh, when he announced that he fundamentally opposed pineapple on pizza. <laughs> but who managed to talk him round? The pineapple growers of Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> he talked himself round. Rather candidly, he said that presidential power had gone to his head. <laughs> he said, I do not have the power to make laws which forbid people to put pineapple on their pizza. I am glad I do not hold such power. <laughs> Why has Donald Trump decided to reinstate Jim Acosta as White House press access? The judge uh, ordered yeah, judge it in yeah. return of it. Yes, he, he decided to because he'd been ordered to by law. Um, <laughs> does anyone know what Trump got confused about this week? Forest fires. He said that the forest should be raked because in Finland <laughs> they rake the forest. Now, how this is going to stop the forest fire, I don't know, but he said this is what they should do. He said he was told by the, the president of Finland yes. that they rake the forest. Yes. And then some journalist, irritatingly, went and asked mm. the president of Finland. He said, I didn't say that, we don't rake the forest. What a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> this is a thing that happens in California virtually every year. They have severe fires and he said nobody could have predicted this. <laughs> <laughs> but yet it happens so seldom in Finland, so it must be because of raking. Yeah. Mustn't it? it can't be because the Finnish forests are perpetually sodden with water. <laughs> <laughs> um, Damien Hirst's statues in Qatar were banned in 2013, but have been uncovered again this week. Why were they controversial? Giant ovary. Yeah, yes. The Hearst Project, made up of 14 giant bronze sculptures outside a hospital, is called The Miraculous Journey, and it graphically charts the voyage from conception to birth. There they are. Do we know they're ovaries? They're not badly done ears, are they? Or that... <laughs> what, with a little baby in them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did he not tell them what he was going to do? 
beforehand. You'd imagine so, wouldn't you? Yeah. I'll just they... do something you'll like. They might, have got an... <laughs> they might have got an inkling when they put the first one up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got another 20 of these in the lorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and referee David McNamara yeah. was banned by the FA. For what? He forgot his coin, so he made... I don't see what all the fuss is about. He didn't have his coin, so he said, all right, we'll do scissors, paper, rock. And he got suspended, and then I think lots of other referees came out in solidarity right. with their fellow ref. And who tried to get round a ban in Russia this week? Specifically, a group of pedestrians in Vladivostok who tried to take a shortcut into the city centre via a vehicle-only bridge. Let's have a look at what they did. Yes, they've all been given a ban, except for Goodney Johansson, who said he won't ban pineapple on pizza. Still, no one really listens to the leader of an insignificant island stuck out in the sea on the fringes of Europe, as Theresa May is finding out. <laughs> Time now for the missing words round, which this week features as its guest publication, Canal Boat Enthusiast's favourite read, Waterways World. You might also enjoy its slightly more racy sister publication, Argy Bargy. <laughs> We start with the Queen will what after Christmas lunch as part of bizarre tradition? Plays darts with Prince Philip. <laughs> no. Oh, no. fart the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> the Queen will weigh Meghan Markle after Christmas lunch as part of bizarre tradition. This is the news that all royal guests are weighed on scales before and after their Christmas visit to oh. Sandringham. It's to make sure that they have eaten plenty and that Andrew isn't stealing the silver. <laughs> Next, what found in a canal near Watford? Theresa May's Brexit deal. <laughs> <laughs> Boat, water. Atlantis. Yeah. Atlantis that found, be good. found in a canal near Watford. <laughs> <laughs> all it's that not, time not... wasting, all those years. It was there, there all the time. <laughs> it's not quite as people had hoped. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is a World War II tank mortar. Oh. This was found by a canal worker who was so excited he immediately jumped 200 feet in the air and disintegrated. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau keeps what under his shirt? Himself. A, a three-piece suit. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is a buzzer to get rid of unwanted guests. This week, TV presenter Alex Trebek claimed that Justin Trudeau keeps a buzzer under his shirt that he can press to alert his staff when a boring event has run on too long. I've got one of those, but the fashion <laughs> run out. <laughs> <laughs> so, the final scores are... Ian and Andy have five points, but oh. the winners are Paul and Deborah with seven. Oh, well done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you down. First skip. Yeah. Before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. <laughs> Marks and Spencer's... Fancy little gas mask range. <laughs> <laughs> Dots will never be the same again. <laughs> and I leave you with news that, as popular resentment of politicians grows, Madame Two Swords unveils its new kicker bastard in the bollocks display. <laughs> in Scotland, Donald Trump completes another brilliant round on his personally designed golf course. <laughs> And as an antique clock is installed at Islington Town Hall, there's a surprising familiarity about the little model figure that comes out as the hour strikes. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Join Nish Kumar and his satirical correspondents for a surreal take on the week's stories in The Mash Report on BBC Two at ten. But here on BBC One next, David Mitchell's back with Lee Mack and Rob Brydon with all new Would I Lie to You? So the word is menopause. Ooh. 